Okay. Very cool. Well, it looks like we've got a good a good start of a crowd. We'll probably continue to have people kind of joining as we go go along. It does look like it's uh just noon, twelve oh one now. So, in the interest of everybody's time, this is being recorded. Um, so if anybody misses a few moments in the first piece, no worries. They absolutely can go back to it. So in the interest of everybody's time, we will make sure um, that we are getting started on time. So um, I'm Rachel. I'm the health educator at the Epilepsy Foundation of Northeastern New York. Um, I'm assuming you are all on our uh, kind of listserv distribution list. So you know uh, mostly what we're doing here. But I really appreciate Dr. McCabe for joining us today. She is a neuropsychologist who's actively practicing at the um, at Albany Med these days. Um, she also is part of our professional advisory board. So we um, are very appreciative of all of the support and um, things that she provides for us uh, throughout the year, including this webinar. So today we'll be talking about ADHD and learning disabilities as comorbidities in epilepsy. Um, if everybody could remain muted throughout the presentation, that would be fantastic. You can absolutely put your cameras on um, if you feel so inclined. I see not a lot of you uh, are so inclined for that at this moment. If you wanted to pop any questions in the chat throughout the throughout the presentation. Um, we will be answering them kind of on an as needed basis, but definitely we'll have time for questions at the end as well. So if you want to, you know, not forget it and pop it in the chat, we might answer it right then or we might keep it till later, depending on uh, what the question is. So thank you all for joining us today and I will hand it over to Dr. McCain. Thanks for being here. And Rachel, if you can just um, like kind of, I probably won't attend to the chat. So if you can just sort of use your discretion, if there's something that makes sense to answer immediately, I'm happy to do so, um, or we can wait. Um, okay, thank you for being here. Um, and I do hope, well, my plan is to have some time at the end to have some question and answer and conversation. So uh, let's get started. Okay, so this is sort of gonna be like the kind of arc of of my talk or conversation here today. Um, we're gonna to talk about some differences in the way that ADHD and epilepsy present, I'm sorry, the way that ADHD and learning disabilities present in people with epilepsy and those without epilepsy. Um, and also some differences between subgroups of epilepsy. Um, and then the implications of these comorbidities, so of ADHD and learning disability. Um, and then some suggestions for management and kind of treatment moving forward. Okay, so before I can talk too much about differences, I really need to start with some definitions, which I, I do understand sometimes get a little bit dull and can drag on. So I, I will try not to drag them on, but I do just want to like highlight the importance um, because it, this really is relevant and I'll sort of wrap back to this. Um, so ADHD is the presence of clinically significant symptoms of attention problems um, and or hyperactivity and impulsivity across settings. And the clinical significance is hugely important here because attention problems are normal. We all have trouble with attention at various points in our life at, in various settings. So understanding the sort of that these are beyond what's usual in making an ADHD diagnosis really is an important thing and, and not an easy thing always to tease out. Um, these symptoms need to interfere or get in the way of everyday functioning, um, onset in childhood and not have another cause. Um, the sort of terminology around ADHD is often a little bit confusing, um, but the broad overall diagnosis is ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. That's the current terminology. Um, and then there are these three subtypes, so predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive, or hyperactive impulsive, um, and then combined, so a combination of those two. I think what gets confusing is that a child who has, or an adult who has inattentive, 
ADHD, um, we're still going to, that's like the way that we would phrase it is ADHD comma predominantly inattentive. And that's a little bit confusing and potentially misleading because the word hyperactivity is still in that label, even if hyperactivity isn't a significant symptom. But that is the sort of correct and current way of labeling. Um, okay. So I'm gonna move on now to learning disability definitions. Um, and this is really um, persistent deficits or difficulties in reading, writing, or math. So really specific to academic skills. Um, and we find that difficulties are evident on testing. So performance is below average. They're not better. These struggles or these difficulties aren't better explained. Um, and they interfere again, like, like the ADHD definition, there has to be a real interference in everyday life. Um, terminology can be confusing with LD as well. So I'll use the term LD to stand for learning disability. Um, and the terms specific learning disability and learning disorder are kind of used synonymously. Um, I, I would likely will do that today. And then the terms dyslexia and dyscalculia um, can sometimes be used synonymous, synonymously and sometimes are used in sort of a different way. So the terminology is a little confusing. Happy to answer some questions about that later on. Okay, those are basic definitions. I think the things I really want to highlight about both of those definitions is that there is a functional impact in everyday life for both ADHD and LD. And then the very specific nature of a learning disability is that it's about academic skills, reading, writing, and math. Okay, so let's talk about some differences. Um, starting with base rates, which are really striking. So as you are probably not surprised to hear, patients with epilepsy have a much higher rate of ADHD diagnosis and learning disability diagnosis. Um, these numbers are variable depending on sort of what population you look at, what study you look at. But the sort of takeaway message here is that patients with epilepsy have a much higher rate of both of these comorbidities. Um, and in terms of ADHD, it's really quite high, maybe as high as like two to four, uh, two to four times higher and about two or two and a half times higher in the case of learning disability. So it's substantial. Um, the other thing that's really interesting and different about the way that ADHD presents in people with epilepsy compared to those without, um, the predominance of diagnosis of ADHD in people without epilepsy is, is that men or boys are more likely to be diagnosed than girls or women. And that um, sort of sex bias goes away in epilepsy so that it's a really much more kind of one-to-one -one rate of diagnosis. So girls with epilepsy compared to girls without epilepsy are more likely to be diagnosed and the proportions are relatively equal in epilepsy patients. Um, and then also a difference is that in patients with epilepsy um, who also have ADHD, the proportion of those who have the inattentive subtype or and therefore have inattentive symptoms is much higher than in the um, ADHD only population. In an ADHD only population, without epilepsy, the combined subtype is really the most common. And in patients with epilepsy, the inattentive subtype is the most common. Okay, so how do these comorbidities, symptoms, diagnoses look different in patients with epilepsy versus those without? Well, I, I need to point out that these are behavioral diagnoses, which means that they are made based on um, behavior. And when I say behavior, I, I do not mean like sort of bad behavior. I, I mean like presentation in everyday life. Um, we are looking at that to determine, are these symptoms clinically significant? Is this person really um, struggling in a, in a significant way with an academic skill? And because of that, um, the host people with and without epilepsy, they are going to share many symptoms um, because just by virtue of how we make these diagnoses. But as you can anticipate and maybe have some very real experience with, um, it's a more complicated picture than that. So the level of complexity 
in patients with epilepsy who have also an ADHD or learning disability diagnosis is generally greater. They tend not to be sort of garden variety or plain, simple, pure ADHD or learning disability. It, it tends to be a much more like nuanced and there are other kinds of concerns that are going on in the background too. Um, those concerns could be quite variable. Um, they may be about cognition. So it may be that there are other cognitive skills that are also weak, perhaps language, um, perhaps executive skills, perhaps overall sort of intellectual ability, like kind of thinking and power um, for reasoning. Um, skills like working memory and processing speed are, are very often troublesome for patients with epilepsy um, in the context of ADHD and learning disability diagnoses and when those diagnostic criteria are not met. Um, and then the emotional and behavioral Functioning of a person with epilepsy can be more often is more complicated um, because of their epilepsy diagnosis and all of that, all that that entails. So although the diagnostic criteria are the same, the picture is more complex in patients with epilepsy. Um, this is an probably an imperfect analogy, but I think the visual piece is helpful here. So if we sort of appreciate that these um, sketched in spheres are representative of patients who have ADHD or a learning disability that do not have epilepsy. Like there's some complication in there. They're not, they're not all the same. And they, um, there's some variability in how these things present. Um, but there's also some simplicity in the overall picture here and the, sort of the variability between these pictures. And, and I think that's in contrast to the level of complexity that is often seen in patients who have epilepsy and an ADHD or learning disability diagnosis. You can just see that the level of variety in between patients is greater and um, the number of surfaces on these um, spheres is Great. And so there is there are many things to consider that that are likely to be relevant um, in terms of understanding and intervention that that perhaps aren't as relevant in um, in patients without epilepsy. Okay. So um, one thing that is often complicated to determine is to think about like is a, a person's attentional lapse. Um, a, a seizure or or an attentional lapse, just an attentional lapse. Um, and this is not to be construed as medical advice, uh, but some general guidelines. So absence seizures or staring spells um, generally are not interruptible uh, with like a touch to the shoulder or calling somebody's name. Um, and they will occur in any context, including in the midst of physical activity and come on relatively quickly. In contrast to um, an attentional lapse, which is likely to come out of sort of boredom um, or doing one task for a long period of time is unlikely to happen in the midst of physical activity. So there's, there are some differences there. Um, and I want to highlight for the first time, but not the last, that attentional problems do persist once seizures are controlled. So it's not it's not that it's necessarily one or the other. It, it really could be both at different points in time. Um, and it's not that once we've sort of medically controlled absence seizures that there are no longer any attentional problems. So it really is a complicated picture to disentangle. Okay, um, so within the group of patients who have epilepsy, there is tremendous variety and variability. Epilepsy is not a unitary disease um, and it has many causes. And so the presentation of ADHD and learning disability and even the likelihood of diagnosis is variable depending on many factors related to epilepsy. So the kinds of comorbidities that somebody might have, including ADHD and learning disability, as well as how um, impactful they are, will vary by 
the cause of epilepsy, the age at which seizures onset, the um, type of epilepsy and how persistent seizures are. Of course, with more persistent, less well-controlled seizures being more predictive of um, greater comorbidity or greater cognitive consequence. Not always, but in general. Um, some patients with epilepsy have like broader developmental or intellectual disabilities, and that increases the likelihood of also having an ADHD or a learning disability diagnosis. And then of course, the impact of medication. Um, and the impact of medication is somewhat complex, but the sort of most, most consistent finding is that in in patients who require polytherapy, so more than one medication to treat their symptoms, uh, the likelihood of comorbid cognitive concerns, including ADHD and learning disability, is greater. Okay. Um, I'll just have everybody just kind of mute yourself unless you have a question and then jump in. So let's think through when some of these concerns onset. A um, big old, it depends here. Of course, there's so much individual variability, but we can say some things. Um, don't get too bogged down in this picture over here. I'll, I'll get to it. So in most patients, cognitive concerns predate or, or are coincident with epilepsy diagnosis. Um, and, and that is not always true, but it is often true. And cognitive concerns and seizures, sort of the reason for that is that they're understood to have the same core etiology or cause. So I have um, simplified this picture for us to kind of look through because it is helpful. You can see this is showing us that seizures of epileptic activity are down here at the bottom and comorbidities, including ADHD and learning disabilities are both caused by neuropathology or something that has gone on in the brain. It could be a tumor, it could be um, a heterotopia or a migrational concern, uh, it could be a brain injury, but the Oh, it could be something genetic, so the many potential causes. But the um, idea here is that that neuropathology, which may be unknown, um, is the root core um, and, and the same cause for both seizures and their comorbidities, their cognitive comorbidities, in, in this case, what we're talking about. Um, that is sort of the biggest takeaway from this picture, but it is not the only thing because you can see there's some other arrows here, three and four that we haven't looked at. And that is that seizures or uncontrolled electrical activity can um, lead to further neuropathology um, and also lead to further comorbidity. So uncontrolled seizures are not good for the brain and can cause greater cognitive consequence. We do have a question in the chat. If yeah. You so with these studies, does the addition of anti-epileptic medications impact on attention and memory factor into the behavior as well as intellectual capacity? Yeah, it's a very complicated question to answer, but thank you for asking it. Um, I, I'm just going to briefly say that I, I think you can probably presume why it's complicated to answer, right? Because it's hard to control for this in um, a research study. So it's we're not going to give anti-epileptic medications to folks who do not require them to determine the impact on um, cognitive function. And we are not going to withhold anti-epileptic anti-epileptic medications from people who need them, um, actually in large part because we know that uncontrolled seizures and electrical activity worsen cognitive outcomes. So I just want to sort of start there and say that it's a complicated question to answer. Um, what I will say is that the, in general, the impact of uncontrolled seizures on cognitive function, as well as the brain, is generally thought to be worse than the impact of medication, in particularly current medications. Um, again, I'm speaking overall, like not in very specific terms to a particular patient or person. Um, so yes, these medications can have an impact on attention and memory, 
there's a lot of variability in terms of the impact. And then newer medications, which are by and far most commonly used at this point, have a, a relatively little impact, actually. Um, and then there's another thing I'll just say. Well, let me come back. I'm sure that this isn't the, the sort of the end of this, this question, and not, not just from you, Genesis, but from others as well. So I'm sure we'll wrap back to it. Um, thanks for the thanks. Okay, so let me kind of keep going here. Okay, so let's let's move on and think a little bit about implications um, of all of these concerns. Okay, so uh, the implications are really significant. Um, uh, there's just no other way to put this. 80% um, of people with active epilepsy also have a cognitive or a behavioral disorder. So, you know, that would include something like ADHD or learning disability. Certainly could also include anxiety or depression. It could include intellectual disability. It could include an autism spectrum disorder. Uh, that's a very, very high number and something we all need to be really quite um, aware of. Um, and then just also to highlight the burden of these comorbidities is that, um, Parents and patients, when they're asked, rate cognitive comorbidities as their second greatest concern in caring for the patient, either their child or themselves, if they're an adult. Um, I actually don't recall what the first greatest concern is, but I suspect it was, you know, seizure control and sort of like general safety. Um, but that is a, a like do these these sort of two stats very. Um, simply highlight the significance of the problem here and just how impactful it can be. Um, also to highlight, and don't worry, don't get too bogged down in this, I'll walk through it with you. Um, these are pictures that are highlighting the cognitive problems uh, on formal testing that, that patients with epilepsy are showing at the time of diagnosis. And these are patients with relatively straightforward epilepsy. So there's no finding on MRI um, and um, their seizures are ultimately relatively well controlled on a single medication. And they are presenting as um, functioning reasonably well in everyday life. And, and this is part of a research study, so we can kind of know that about them before. And, and also these are at the time of diagnosis. So these each of these graphs is really showing the same, the um, this axis here is showing the same uh, cognitive functions and they're just in different epilepsy populations. And we're not gonna get into the specifics here, but what I wanna highlight is that this zero line where you can see my mouse hopefully going is <clears throat> average functioning in typical healthy developing people. And across all of these skills, which include academic skills, include vocabulary knowledge, include expressive language skills, include impulsivity, uh, motor function. The performance is at least to, to some degree below age expectation across all of these skills in newly diagnosed, relatively non-complex patients with epilepsy. Um, Genesis, kind of getting back to your initial question, this actually does shed some light on the question about medication, and it, it is um, pretty fairly Clearly, clearly telling us about the prevalence of these cognitive concerns early on, before or at the time of diagnosis, and before medication has has been um, started. Okay, so let me just say a little bit as well about implications. Um, ADHD and learning disabilities are very likely to be underdiagnosed and therefore undertreated in patients with epilepsy. And um, I don't think we have to go to sort of extend ourselves too far to appreciate the way that that can lead to misunderstanding. Um, and so in one study where they were looking at patients um, with epilepsy, a third of patients had, just a third, had a neurobehavioral diagnosis, meaning any sort of diagnosis involving ADHD or learning disabilities or behavior or emotional function before they participated in the study in which they were looking at sp symptoms specifically and then making diagnosis. So just a third. And, you know, we, we saw that ultimately 80% of patients end up with a diagnosis. Um, and so if, if there's not an appreciation for these comorbidities, um, if they are perhaps not either not 
um, diagnosed or not well understood, it may be a little confusing to people. Um, so you may, for example, think, well, my child or my student or my neighbor's um, epilepsy is well controlled, perhaps, and they are still really struggling to keep up in school, to get off of the bus on time to get their homework done on time, whatever the symptom may be. Um, and I think that highlights again, the importance of really considering routine the, these comorbidities that are so impactful and also so prevalent. Okay, there we go. Um, these, the, on top of, um, the, the impact that epilepsy can have um, on these areas, the comorbidities sort of additionally compromise or have the potential to compromise things like quality of life, um, everyday kind of interpersonal and intrapersonal functioning, so sort of how you can move about in the world and get along with people, um, as well as how you feel about yourself, um, and also academic and occupational ach achievement. And again, um, both epilepsy and ADHD and learning disabilities sort of separately have an impact and then have this kind of additive or perhaps multiplicative impact um, together. Okay, so the implications are significant and um, meaningful. So let's let's think through some management strategies a little bit here. Um, I would just say at the outset to approach approach this uh, with a sense of kind of curiosity and awareness um, that fuels the way we develop our understanding. And part of that, it can be gained from kind of open and humble conversations between teachers and parents, parents and teachers really both ways, and also with medical providers. And I'll just say that I think in our busy and strained medical system, the burden for bringing up concerns related to thinking, learning, mood, anxiety, um, often falls to the patient themselves or their caregiver. Um, and so I, I would like to just like, encourage folks to bring up those kinds of concerns um, and sort of be um, empowered to have some agency in doing that, given how we now know how frequent the symptoms are and how intrusive or impactful they can be. Um, in terms of managing these comorbidities in the context of epilepsy, there's some guidelines actually about screening for them. So we know very well at this point that the rates of ADHD or learning disability, as well as other diagnoses, are high in patients with epilepsy. And therefore, routine screening is um, kind of regular, like, uh, should be a part of regular care. Um, at the time of diagnosis or by age six, this is kind of specific to ADHD. Um, and then with annual repetition and certainly with more um, sensitivity and care around the time of medication changes, I'm kind of specifically talking about anti-epileptic medication changes, um, because that can change the way that symptoms present, um, usually acutely like in the, in the short term. Um, the other thing I, I just can't highlight enough is the importance of a, a thorough and thoughtful evaluation, um, which, which can be done through a school, can also be done through a neuropsychologist. Um, if you remember back kind of in the earlier slides, the, thinking about like the complexity of of cognitive function that patients with epilepsy often present with. So even if they have an ADHD or a learning disability diagnosis, that's often not it. It's often a little bit more complicated than that. And it's really in understanding the complexity and the nuance that um, we can develop sort of sensitive and individualized strategies for moving forward. And also, um, build awareness and understanding. 
Um, so broadening our understanding, even just our knowledge of how frequent these comorbidities are. And I just want to say um, here that it, it can be a, a little tricky. So if you have an ADHD or a learning disability diagnosis and you also have epilepsy, sometimes that additional diagnosis really is quite meaningful because it is like a, like sort of a language that school systems or other systems can have familiarity with and they sort of therefore understand in a in a more uh, because there are more patients with just ADHD or just learning disability than there are with epilepsy. So they'll understand kind of what the implications of that might be. Um, and not, not to say that that's easy, but I, I just want to highlight that the person who is not ultimately diagnosed with ADHD or learning disability, but does have some cognitive consequences that are associated with their epilepsy that just don't meet criteria for a diagnosis like that can be a really tricky thing to be under to be understood across settings and scenarios okay so medication is a treatment option and i um, typically encourage people to just to just be sort of open-minded about this to gather information with their medical providers i'm a phd i do not prescribe medication uh, and so that, that the person to consult with about this is the medical provider and that should be done um, with care and openness on on both sides here and also with the knowledge base that most medications used to treat ADHD are, in general, not specific, but in general, are reasonably well tolerated in patients with epilepsy. Um, but there's so much variability. And so, as with any patient, monitoring for symptoms is really critically important. And I think I encourage openness to think about, like, sort of what are the non medication alternatives, which we'll talk about a little here. Um, but also, how impactful is are these symptoms in terms of ADHD here specifically on uh, daily life? And does it make sense to kind of open up our minds and consider that as an option? Um, there's lots of research evidence to support the efficacy or the impact of behavioral supports in patients with ADHD. And I'll just sort of include that. Um, when I say behavioral supports, I really mean just like sort of ways to um, intervene that are not medication related, and that can take on many different um, methods and approaches. So parent training, workplace and classroom management, and some skills training as well. Um, we just think kind of broadly about the way that intervention can vary. Remember at the beginning, like I had said, that in order to have an ADHD or a learning disability diagnosis, you you have to have met these behavioral diagnostic criteria. And um, so many of the symptoms are really gonna be very similar to patients who have ADHD or learning disability who don't have epilepsy. But that's not the full picture. But in the top here are some suggestions that are relevant to people with and without epilepsy. They may not be implemented in exactly the same way, but there really is some overlap here. So it, for example, and this is not meant to be um, an exhaustive list of all of the ways of providing support, um, but it's, a, it's some. And so special education, perhaps if there's a learning disability in reading, then providing specialized instruction in targeted reading would be appropriate. Um, thinking about how the classroom is modified to help to manage attention, um, how we administer tests if the child or, or um, adult is like getting older and has to take either tests through school or perhaps through um, like, like a state, a person who's employed with the state. Um, and then thinking about like the use of technology, um, I've had a couple of uh, older patients in middle school and high school use, you know, things like um, smartwatches that can buzz, they can set them to buzz or to vibrate um, subtly at times that are relevant. So like the first couple of minutes after they sit down in a class that buzzes to remind them to check their binder to see that they have any, if they have any homework to turn in. So lots of ways of thinking about that. And then executive skills or executive functioning training. So, so specific and collaborative work on how do I prioritize all of the things I have to do as a high school student? What do I get done first? What can wait? Um, thinking about kind of how to manage organizational demands and um, planning for all of that. <clears throat> 
And then, and then I think some in patients with epilepsy specifically, there are some other factors to really kind of consider and be both be aware of and intervene on. Um, so there may be, like I had just talked about, these other cognitive concerns that do not fall in the sort of diagnostic buckets of ADHD or learning disability um, and may require some other kind of more refined treatments or interventions or different ways of instruction. Um, fatigue is a very significant issue in patients with epilepsy and broadly patients with neurological diagnoses um, and appreciating the impact that fatigue can have on a child or an adult who is working hard to keep up in everyday life and their context. Um, I, I think even just recognizing the, the way that fatigue can look different in different people is very helpful. So in a young kid, it may look like a lot of um, irritability or hyperactivity at the end of the day, whereas a high school student may really struggle to get out of bed in the morning, like many high school students do, um, but perhaps even with uh, an adequate amount of sleep the night before and the nights before. Um, and then the impact of adjusting medications um, to control seizures can have kind of this sort of acute impact on everyday functioning, acute, again, meaning sort of short-term or circumscribed impact on everyday functioning. Um, and then finally, there's the broader context of like the, the impact implications of having epilepsy and the um, kind of stigma that still surrounds that and the potential for um, embarrassment um, and psychosocial impact in um, everyday life and recognizing just the, the way that that is absolutely intertwined with the way that we treat and address these comorbidities. Kind of can't understate that. There we go. Um, and then finally thinking through some ways to understand is something a seizure versus an attentional lapse. Again, like communication, I think is just critically important here so that there's an open line of communication between parents and teachers and caregivers. We can attempt to interrupt um, what is either a seizure or an attentional lapse that might give us some information. And when I say interrupt, I mean like a hand to the hand or a hand to the shoulder, calling somebody's name. Um, video recording is it's just really, really helpful often to neurologists. And then I, again, just education wise, I encourage you to remember that there is a really high rate of co-occurrence. So it may actually be both, maybe not in one um, instance, but it, it may be both in that there are some times that are, it is an absence seizure and there are some times when it is an attentional lapse. Um, and that, that is possible. That, could, that is sort of reflects the complexity of, of life. Okay, so that's what, that's the, the end of kind of what I had planned for us. And I guess I would just leave by saying thank you for your attention and grace, and also uh, to encourage um, communication and awareness and curiosity as you work with whomever it is that like sort of brought you here today. Um, and I think that there's just so much that can be gained about by implementing these sort of core human human values and human ways of, of being uh, that, that can lead to really compassionate and thoughtful ways of moving forward um, for all of us. So thanks for your attention. I'm happy to chat. So we did get a couple throughout. So one being is quality of sleep factored into these complexities when making a diagnosis. Individuals with epilepsy can often have poor or irregular sleep patterns and then lack of sleep can increase or even mimic ADHD symptoms. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, you are exactly right. That's true in I understand that you're sort of highlighting patients with epilepsy and like the risk for poor sleep, either quantity or quality um, here, but but that is true of everyone that um, poor sleep, too little sleep can really look a whole lot like attention problems. Um, I think that this is a relatively, it's not really new, new, but I think thinking about teasing out sleep as a, um, like a potential, variable. So, so in other words, in other words, in the research, like assessing how the quality and quantity of patients sleep and, and evaluating how that impacts 
outcomes like ADHD diagnosis or attentional symptoms. I think that is a relatively new um, way of thinking about this and of go and of of trying to quantify that. I think it's a very valid and useful point, but I, I don't think there's a ton of research. And I'm happy to think about this a little bit more. Um, I, I, I think like what I would say, again, this is, is that the interest in sleep and its impact on cognition is longstanding. It has gained broader interest, I think in the last like 20 years. Um, and then I think it's sort of like trickling down to the very specific impact it has in various various patients, epilepsy in this case, with medical diagnoses. Um, and then I see someone with a pun. Why do we focus so much on children with ADHD and not talk about with adults with ADHD? Thank you. You're right. Um, I will tell you not not to be defensive, but in part that is because of what I do. I work with I work with almost exclusively kids. Um, but yes, kids are going to become adults eventually. And how do we live independently as a person with epilepsy and ADHD? Um, Darlene, if you want to jump in and like, uh, I don't, I don't know, if you want to kind of clarify your question or, or like ask a secondary question, please feel free or, or speak to that's fine. Um, and I'm happy to come back and, and address that. Um, and then Johanna. Sorry, I'm just reading this. Give me one sec. Oh, yes, this this goes both ways. Yes, your question. So uh, I can speak very specifically to ADHD. So so rates of ADHD diagnosis in patients with epilepsy are much higher than in the general population. But rates of epilepsy diagnosis in patients with ADHD are also much higher. So I think that's kind of getting to your your question there, Johanna. Tell me if I'm not getting to it. Um. And then Alexandra, um, can an LD diagnosis occur without ADHD diagnosis? Yes, absolutely, it can occur without them. Yeah, they don't have to be one and the same. Um, a learning disability um, diagnosis, I, I think I saw you kind of having a trouble with your internet connection, maybe in and out at the very beginning, but a learning disability diagnosis is very specific to academic skills, so reading, writing, and math. Um, and an ADHD diagnosis is really kind of very specific to attention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. You certainly could have both, either as a person with or without epilepsy, um, but you could also have just one or and not the other. Um, so yeah, so it's just if you want to elaborate on your question, I'm happy to, to answer further. What else? Other questions? Can I elaborate on what I was saying? Please, thank you. Um, yeah, I. I was just trying to say in like a short form, I, I personally, I was diagnosed as an adult. Um, I was always told, you know, that I was always like hyper and like energizer bunny, um, despite having epilepsy as a kid. But when you're a kid, you know, a lot of times in the whole system of things, you know, you don't, we don't always think about how we're going to, you know, take the kids, I mean, with these 529 college plans, yes, but, you know, a lot of times we don't think of how we're going to take the kids and bring them into the adult system and, like, here, see you later and send them on their way. So, basically, how are we going to take the kids and, you know, with ADHD, learning disability, and, you know, go on with your life? Um, I've learned through Facebook groups you know, there's a lot of adults that have ADHD and I've learned how to, you know, get support that way. But I mean, there's, you know, not a lot of, you know, adult, you know, support out there except for social media that I'm aware of, you know, because basically when you're a kid, you know, you're just set out, you know, on a sailboat, see you later. <laughs> Well, I think, Darlene, like the other thing that changes is that the structure of life, like sort of can fall away from you as you enter into high school and adulthood. And there's no longer this literal like schedule kind of holding your life together, um, which really demands a lot of all adults. Um, but in particular, if that sort of hits your skill weaknesses if you're somebody who has ADHD you struggle with things like 
staying focused and completing activities and managing time. And maybe there were some structures in place, even if they weren't formal supports that like helped you to do those things along the way. And then as an adult, you don't, and you no longer have all of that. I, th I, I think that, um, I think you're right. I mean, I think we don't always do a great job of ensuring that the way we support youth with ADHD empowers them to be able to do some of those things on their own in, a, in adulthood. And then I, I think the other piece that you're maybe hitting on is just that like sort of transition of care from a more pediatric setting to a more adult setting and just how sort of challenging that can be. And that uh, on average adult providers are maybe less well versed and equipped in managing all of these and, and even um, understanding all of these comorbidities. Is, is that fair to say what, what you're also getting at? It, it is and I mean, I, I know there might be some other people on the line that are, you know, on this meeting that are you know, want to, you know, say something about what I'm going to say, but I'm going to freely admit that I've done wrong at times where I, you know, sometimes self-treat myself and, you know, here's my cup. I love my caffeine. That's my drug of choice rather than taking ADHD medication. Um, because caffeine sometimes interferes with seizures, but, um, the uh, ADHD medication that I was given before hasn't done the best either. But I mean, I need something, you know, because with my seizure medicine, it also causes me some short term memory loss and, you know, cognition problems too. So, you know, it's like at my house, I mean, I need everything labeled. Mm. But then who wants to have anybody come over to your house and see everything labeled around your house? Yeah, so I, I think took we... all the labels off and it's like, now it looks like a wreck, you know? So, I mean, do you want to, you know, how do you want it? You know? And I mean, that's how I'm like, well, how do the kids want it? Cause I mean, the kids, their parents are there to help them. So it's like, now, how are you trying to help these kids and send them on to adulthood? Well, Darlene, if I can just um, kind of wrap this part up by saying that you, I think are highlighting for us the very real ways that these comorbidities can impact someone in everyday life. Um, even even psychosocially, so like that, that that it's having an impact on the way you function socially. Um, I do see Johanna, your second question there. Thank you for clarifying um, um, about whether really siblings, parents and siblings of a child with epilepsy and ADHD or behavioral issues are also more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. Um, I, I would like to double check that. My my gut is to say yes, but let me double check and I'll get your contact information from Rachel and follow up with you on that. But thank you for the, the very good question. Um, and Alexandra, can you share resources, training information to support a kid with a learning disability? Yeah. Um, let me say a couple of things that I think are helpful. So the website understood, I think it's understood.com. Rachel, do you know that? Is it understood.com? No? Okay. Uh, let me, I'm pretty sure that that's what it is. So if you just, if you Googled understood and learning disabilities, you would come up with the website. So that is a very useful resource. Um, and then, yeah, it is understood.com. Okay, thank you. I just want to type that in there without it being accurate. And then there's a, also a website, Parent to Parent of New York State, that has a lot of information about your um, rights. And as a parent of a child with a, um, not only a learning disability, but um, many kinds of conditions that qualify them for special education um, in New York State. And then the other things I would say, let's see, learning disability specifically. Um, can you say, is it is it in reading specifically? There's kind um, of a lot, sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah, no, just generally. So uh, my kid was recently diagnosed with a learning disability through the school. And her neurologist uh, did some tests to see if she also had HDHD and she didn't uh, have enough information. I guess she couldn't make a, a, a determination or a diagnosis of ADHD. That's why I was like trying to, to understand if they had to be, you know, necessarily together or not. 
but then now I have the this, the learning disability diagnosis. I'm like, okay, so what do I do now? Like, I'm trying to figure out how what what can I do to better support my child yeah. in their learning development. So, did with a learning disability diagnosis in a child, they then should have access to special education services in their school, and usually the way that goes is that then an IEP or an individualized education plan is started. Did that happen? Yes. So, so I have, well, she has now an IEP, so I guess it's more, but it, that's what the school is kind of providing to her. Hence my question is, okay, what else can I do as a parent to also support her? Yeah. Well, I think it's a, it's a little, I don't, I'm not, I'm not asking you to get into the specifics in this context, but I will just say that it's a little hard to be very specific without knowing all of those details. Um, let me just like make a presumption that this is, um, and it is a presumption, Alexandra, you don't have to give correct me if, if you don't want, but um, if it's in reading, which is most common, then is one thing I think to, to make sure is that the kind of intervention that they're getting at school is the right kind of intervention, meaning that it's targeting the, the area that they struggle with in reading. So in reading, that's usually phonics-based skills or comprehension or both, it could be both. But if they really struggle with phonics, the kind of instruction they're getting in school shouldn't be about comprehension. And, and that as a parent admittedly is pretty hard to tease out. Um, but that's one thing. I'm gonna again, kind of go further along in my presumption here that um, if the trouble is with phonics, meaning that your child can't read independently, can't automatically recognize words, then at home, as long as they're getting good and enough instruction at school, meaning intensive, um, then, I often encourage parents to work hard to build a real love for reading um, at home and make sure you do the things that you probably are already doing. We can we can assume that a kiddo who's struggling to read is going to find it frustrating, like just like we all do with the things we struggle with. I find Zumba to be incredibly frustrating because I'm not very good at it. It's really just a condition of being human. And so we want to like counteract that struggle with um, sort of build up the interest in reading by showing that reading is fun. It's a way to discover, learn, um, express ourselves. And so that's that would be like kind of my strongest and primary recommendation. And then it, the other thing I would say is that if you're looking to like kind of do some specific exercises at with your child at home is to um, have like a, a clear line of communication between the um, special educator who's helping them at school and ask them to give you some suggestions for what their work, for how to support at home that is like in line with what is being done at school. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's a really good question, Johanna. Um, Rachel, can I, I'm gonna pump this to you as I think a little bit here, but how much of the Epilepsy Foundation training is related to this comorbidity stuff? Or is it really more about um, sort of seizure safety? And, and I'm just gonna think while you respond. Yeah, yeah. So um, most of our kind of teacher trainings or even the general population trainings are more recognition and first aid, so responding to it. There's really not a huge piece of that that is, you know, behavioral issues or, you know, any sort of comorbidities, unfortunately. We don't have a great kind of training on those those pieces at the moment. I feel like, Johanna, what you're maybe like looking for is something, because, because you know, there's a couple ways of getting this information out. One would be to have like have an evaluation that like very specifically describes the concerns that you or your child is having um and then provide some suggestions but i think so that's one route and i think a reasonable one given how high the rate of comorbidity is in patients with epilepsy but then the other is um is there like a kind of like a one page blurb like like a that that like very simply and generically or generally summarizes some of maybe what we've talked about here today about just how high the rates of comorbidity are. Um, that sure would be nice. 
I, I don't have that, uh, but that does not mean that it doesn't exist. And I, I like the idea of it. Um, it's an interesting idea. I think, I think that, um, I think in what I do, because I'm because I'm doing these long evaluations of kids with epilepsy. So I, uh, to be frank, I haven't really like sought this out. Uh, so I, I really do appreciate the inquiry uh, because I, because I'm sort of doing the other side, like the first side of what I suggested, which is providing all these kind of very specific details about how somebody's functioning and and the impact. Um, so it is kind of specific and not general. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let, I'm happy to be in touch with you a little bit. I, I, I think this is that, that question in particular is really um, relevant, not just to you and your situation, but, but broadly too. And I can imagine it being kind of a nice thing for many of the neurologists I work with to like have access to a little, a little. So I, I, I'm grateful for the idea and suggestion. I can't promise like the speediest, the speediest follow-up, but I, I am interested in like in putting something like that together. I think it seems useful and maybe it's already out there. Um, you've probably searched for it, but I will do a little searching myself, but think about what we can come up with. Thank you. I think we've covered all of the questions. We probably have time for, you know, maybe one or two more. If anybody has any uh, additional questions or anything that those past questions had pop up in your brain. If not, then I will be sending a follow-up email with the recording of this training um, and um, contact information for anybody who's interested in it um, shortly, probably.